everyone, good morning. Uh, I guess it's close to lunch now. It's morning for me. I'm Ben Edmonds. Uh, ben Edmonds at, on Twitter and benedmonds.com. If you want to check out my blog, I blog like once a year, so it's riveting content in there. Um, no spaces in that name if you're checking it out on Twitter. I do a little bit of open source work. I uh, wrote Build Secure PHP Apps. It's an ebook that's available on LeanPub, which I will give you a coupon code for at the end. I do the PHP Town Hall podcast with my buddy Phil Sturgeon, who's also giving uh, some talks you should check out while you're here. And I'm the CTO of Mindfulware. We do insurance and medical software. And it's mostly white label software. We use a lot of PHP and Node. So if you want to discuss any of that, um, come see me after. Is this for me? Yeah, sure. Great. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through um, a little bit of what's happened in the past few years in PHP. Some that's a little older, some that's a little newer. It's uh, going to be pretty high level. We're going to cover a bunch of topics. The idea is to kind of dip your toes in the water, and then we can discuss more later, or you can research more later on your own, things that interest you. The general concept of this is just to get a bunch of the ideas out there, show you a lot of cool things, and hopefully pique your interest. What we'll be covering, we'll go through exceptions, closures, namespaces, static syntax, short array syntax, PDO, a little bit on security as well. And then we'll go through at the end some tools that PHP has available now, such as the built-in server, composer, and some unit testing tools that are out there. All right, let's get started. Exceptions, what are exceptions? Traditionally, in you know, like old procedural PHP code, if you had a logic block, you needed to catch something that wasn't happening correctly. Can you hear me in the back? Should I talk louder? All right. I mumble a lot, so sorry if I start doing that. Just grunt, and I'll get louder again. Uh, so with exceptions, this gives you logic flows so you can tell when something doesn't happen appropriately. So when an error happens in your software, when something doesn't return what it should, when you have just a bad thing happening. Here's what an exception looks like. You're going to go try and then a block. And then inside that, you're going to put what you want to try, what you want to happen. And then if at any point in there it throws an exception, it'll, catch, it'll go to your catch block. So here we're doing a catch. We're just doing an exception E. There's different types of exceptions. You can make your own exceptions. And then you can catch certain types. So for example, if you're doing um, so like a guzzle call, if you're doing API work, you're making a curl request, you can catch exceptions for certain types of error codes. So let's say you want to catch 500 responses or 400 responses or any certain type of error response, you can do that via exceptions. That way you can structure your code in a way that here's what should happen and here's the different error states that could possibly happen without a bunch of the if-else blocks and it makes it a lot cleaner. It also gives your classes more control in that they can promote exceptions for certain types of events. So your classes that are going through, in this case, we're doing, uh, what was the example we used? So Guzzle, so Guzzle, we're doing an API call. We're going through, we're going to try to request something. Let's say we're requesting a user from Twitter. That fails. That Twitter class that we have could then say, OK, we have an exception just for invalid users. And then we'll promote that exception up. In PHP, it's the throw command. We'll throw that exception. And then we can catch that and act on it. Closures, you've probably seen if you've used any JavaScript. That's what most people know it from if they don't have a CS background. A closure is an anonymous function that takes data in and acts on it. And PHP got this in, I believe, PHP 5.3 or 5.4. It's fairly new, but it's not cutting edge at all. In this case, uh, we're using an example using a Laravel style route, um, in this case we're just doing a git for the forward slash, which would be whatever route you want to pass through, which is your default route. And then we're throwing in an anonymous function after that to act on it. So here we've just got a function for the git, and then we're going to do something inside that function. It really doesn't matter in this case what we're doing inside there. But you can see that instead of the name function being passed in as that second parameter, it's a function without a name.
Namespace is. All right. So the idea behind a namespace is that you can structure your code in logical containers, and then that gives you a less conflicts. So for example, if you had a class named user, and some other library you're using has a class named user, without a namespace on that, those class names would conflict between each other. With a namespace, you can say, OK, so my user class is under my app, or whatever your software is named. The library I'm using is under auth, or some namespace like that. In that case, auth user and my app user would be two separate entities that would not conflict. So you can use them both at the same time, and you just reference them through their parent container, which in this case is a namespace. What this looks like, you define a namespace. At the top there, here we're using another Laravel example, Illuminate Console. Then the class is command. So this command class is going to live under Illuminate Console. That's its parent container. That's its home. In order to use that later, if you don't want to explicitly spell it out when you go to implement that, you'll hit the use command. So use Illuminate Console command tells it. So in the context that we're in right now, we're going to use this namespace, this container for this object. You could also, when you go to hit new command, you could also just call it all out. And then I'll use that specific one. Statics. So statics, um, it's a shortcut to call a method on a class. It gives you different scoping than you would get with a normal inheritance model. And it uh, can be shorthand, or it could just be a grouping of similar functions together under one parent. They do not have inheritance, and they don't have um, relations between them. So usually, you're going to, there are ways to do that, but traditionally, they don't. When you use that, you're going to basically just call them as a one-off. So it's very similar to a function call in procedural PHP, where you're just calling one function that does one thing. Stacks are very similar to that. There's a lot of different use cases, but in general, that's what you want to try to stick with. So in this case, we're defining route static function get. And then to use that, we're just going to do route colon colon get. And that's going to call that. We don't have to instantiate route. We don't have to do route equals new route, route get. We can just straight up go route get as a static. Differences with statics. There's no this object. So you can't do this variable equals whatever, this property equals whatever, and then access it throughout the various methods in that class as you walk through. It doesn't retain the state. This is uh, basically a one-off. Some exceptions to that are var, which is, um, I'm sorry, self, which is the var at definition. So at the point that this was defined, what exists there, that's what self is for. There's also static, which is the var at execution. So not when the class was defined, but when the class was actually executed in your context of your current code, what was the status of that variable there? Okay. If you want to walk through code examples of this later, like I said, we're going to hit a lot of high-level topics really fast. And anything you want to dig into more, I'd be happy to later. Or hopefully it piques your interest to research a bit more. All right, short array syntax. This is uh, pretty much not worth anything, but it's kind of exciting just because it's cleaner. It makes your code look a little prettier. If you're used to JavaScript, you're used to the similar syntax it is. Instead of calling out array like you're used to, you're now going to just use an open and closed bracket, a square bracket. So in this case, this turns into this, which doesn't really look like much of the win. But if you have a few nested arrays, or if you're defining, say, a config object, anything like that where your array is getting fairly complex, it actually um, cleans it up a good bit, makes it look a lot nicer, a little cleaner code. Traits. Traits are a way to group together methods without strict inheritance. So what that means is that we can share methods across classes without that being inherited throughout. We'll walk through this a little deeper because it's hard to explain. Here we have trait base user. 
with a function get name. And in this case, we're just returning a string, but you know that could hit a database or do some manipulation or whatever it might do. So here we have base user. This is our user method get name. Next, we're going to define a class named admin user, and it's going to use base user. So that means that every method defined for base user is imported for the admin user and it's available, but it doesn't inherit that. So you're not extending that. You're just inheriting those methods. So it's basically like including those methods and dropping them into that class. What that looks like is here we have an admin user. Admin user equals new admin user, and then we can echo the get name right away. We didn't have to instantiate the base user at all. We didn't have to do anything with that, but because it's used by admin user, that method's directly available. Next up, PDO. PDO is a cross-system database uh, wrapper for PHP. So what it does is it wraps a bunch of different databases. It gives you um, one interface, in, mostly one interface, into various database systems. And it gives you a few things for performance, for security, things to clean up your code. And it um, really cleans up the whole idea of having to support a bunch of different database systems on your own or use whatever framework you're using in their database. It gives you one, um, one thing to go off of gives you safe binding. What that looks like is here we're preparing a SQL statement. So a lot of times, especially in legacy code bases, you'll see select star from user where ID equals and then they'll drop in the ID variable right inside that string. So it would just be concatenating the string and throwing in the ID. That can be very dangerous because if someone figures out how to pass through that ID, let's say that ID is coming from a URL, then they can easily SQL inject you because they can throw in whatever they want into that ID. Um, it's not properly escaped. What PDO does for you here is we're saying ID equals colon ID. That colon ID is just a marker for us that we're going to replace it. And PDO knows how to read that. Then we're going to bind the param. So we're binding colon ID to the ID variable. So that's going to take care of the escaping for us. And then we execute that statement. So we're preparing the statement. We're getting it ready. We're injecting in any variables we need to the statement, and then we execute it. All right, let's go through a little bit on security. I'm actually really good on time, so if we have questions, we can get a little deeper. All right, we'll go through SQL injection, HTTPS, password hashing, authentication, safe defaults, and uh, a couple common hacks, XSS and CSRF. XSS is like a horrible tongue twister for me, so sorry for that. All right, a little bit on how to escape your input and your output for your sites. So we already covered by param, which you see here. That's uh, the preferred way to escape your input most of the time. But that's not enough, because someone could put malicious code into your database that isn't acted upon until it's brought back out. So also, in your views, when you display your templates back, whether you're doing that, you want to make sure to escape the output as well for anything that could be HTML or, or JavaScript, anything that could be bad for the user's browser, or whatever environment you're in, if you're in a command line or anything like that. HTML entities is going to be your go-to most of the time. Not always, depending on your use case. It's a little out of scope. Most of the time, though, you just want to assume you're going to use HTML entities. That's your go-to. HTTPS is a protocol for secure communications on HTTP over the web. What that does for you is it's going to do end-to-end -end encryption on any traffic that goes over the wire. So you start the connection. You connect to a host. You're, they're both going to negotiate to make sure they are who they think they are. Your certificate gets passed. You have a key that's checked. It gets passed back. There's a little handshake process there. But once you both verify that you are who you say you are to each other, any communication over that line is encrypted so that if anyone's eavesdropping on that, they can't see what's going on in between. 
there's been a lot of uh, NSA issues and leaks recently. So the way most of that works is that they've spoofed or <coughs> infected the certificate authorities, which is what verifies that each person is who they say they are. And so they're able to verify that, oh, I am who you think I am. And then they take that and then they pass the data on. So you, you think you're working properly, but they're actually a man in the middle. HTTP doesn't really help for that, but that's a, a rare use case. Our HTTPS doesn't help for that. Um, that is, um, that's called a man in the middle attack. It's very rare because you have to be trusted by the certificate authority. But if you're wondering about how that works, that's how that works. Um, HTTPS is the preferred way to do any authentication, any credit card data, anything that needs to be secure. A lot of sites are either moving to just HTTPS for everything on the site because it's a very small performance hit to add that SSL handshake. And why not just go ahead and secure your users throughout? Another disadvantage is there's a cost associated. But for any decent sized site, it's a negligible cost for the safety of your users. It's also now required by the OAuth 2 protocol, which is used for mainly for API authentication. And so it's uh, because OAuth 2 doesn't do the three-step handshake in most cases that OAuth 1 did. Um, the two-step requires the wire be encrypted. All right, uh, access control inside your app. There's uh, a few things people do that's wrong about access control. So a lot of times people will say, if you can get to this page, you saw the link that got you to this page, and we only showed the link if you're the proper type of user, so you must be able to do this action. That's not safe because the user could find a way to get there. There could be a code, an issue in your view. Someone could find the URL. Google could index the URL, anything like that. And then the user gets to that page. You want to make sure that you have access control in each page, in each action. Usually that's going to be in a controller or a model where it checks, or a route if you're doing a, like an MVR. It checks to see the users here, do they actually have access to do what I'm about to allow them to do. So in this case, we're just saying, are they actually an admin because they're on an admin page? Not just because they landed here do they have access. We've got to double check that. Another thing you want to make sure you have is brute force protection. It's trivial to crack most users' passwords in uh, almost no time because people use very simplistic passwords and they use them everywhere. Hopefully, those of us in the room use better passwords. Hopefully, we have fairly secure ones. But a lot of users just have, you know, password or their mom's name or what other they might use there. Without a brute force protection, a cracker can just keep running over that, keep trying different passwords until it finds it. Even with just a hash table or a rainbow table, super fast to get into most passwords. What brute force does is it tracks your login attempts. Here we're just saying login attempts greater than five. You need to get a little more detail than that. Usually you want to say X number of login attempts within Y time frame from Z IP. IP is kind of negligible. Whichever way you want to best track that. But you want to say if this user is trying passwords over and over, we want to stop them for X amount of time. Usually 60 seconds is plenty of time, maybe 30 seconds, depending on your use case. If someone's just tried 10 passwords, maybe you want to go ahead and log them out and make them go through the forgot password process. It's a little inconvenience to the user, but it's better to inconvenience them than for them to get hacked. Safe password hashing, PHP 5.5 now includes uh, password hashing built in. So you don't have to go through and trust your framework or write your own password hashing algorithms or maintain your code to do this. Password hashing is a very sensitive part of your system. Hopefully, everyone here is actually hashing something. Hopefully, it's more than MD5. So kind of traditionally, um, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, Everyone just did MD5 in their database on their password string. All right, MD5 has been broken for a long time. Super easy to rainbow table hack. Uh, the way that works is so we have, a, we have a table of words. We hash them all, and then we get the resulting hashes. All right, or just over time, we save these hashes. If I have a table full of hashes, I can just run those against your database. 
and pretty easily find out what the user's password is because you know password md5 always equals the same thing so if we have the table as hashes, we can very quickly find that. Same thing for SHA or anything you're doing that doesn't have the salt. So for a while, people used MD5. MD5 has been broken for a long time. Then we all moved to SHA, SHA1 most of the time, unless you're doing .NET. Um, that's now broken, so we're advocating moving away from SHA. Bcrypt is mostly the accepted standard at the moment for web passwords, which is what password hash is using right now. Password hash will continue to be updated though to use the latest algorithm, whatever is most accepted by the security community at the time. So now you don't even have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about what your algorithm is, what's going on under the hood, keeping track of if it's broken, if it's still safe, anything like that. You can just use password hash and trust PHP to handle it for you. What this looks like is you're going to call password hash on the string. So here we have post pass, which is just the string that the user typed in. So let's say that's password is what they typed in. We're going to hash that. It's going to do a bcrypt. It's going to add a salt to it. It's going to be random salt. So that means every time you run this, it's going to be a different string. It's going to be a different resulting hash. So you can call this 50 times, and it's going to be 50 different hashes. That means you can't easily do a rainbow table hack on it because it's not going to match anything that you have in your table if you've generated a bunch of hashes because they're different every time. That's what a salt is. A salt is a random string that you inject into that. Um, password verify is what you'll use to take that back and verify it against your database. So because these are all random, these are all different each time, there's, the salt is stored inside the string. And so if we pass that salt back through, then we can regenerate the same password again. And that's what password verify does. It takes your string, and then it takes your hash from your database. It's going to pull out your salt, and it's going to rehash using that same stall instead of the random stall. So this time, it's going to compare the two and see if the, if the hashes match. If they do, you're going to get a true back. If they don't, you're going to false. Right? You don't have to worry about any of this under the hood. Now you have very simple, easy methods to use to hash and verify your passwords. So also another method for determining if you're using the latest hashing algorithm. So a lot of times, what Usually what you want to do is, when you go to hash, you want to check and see, oh, am I using the latest algorithm? Oh, no, I'm not. So now that I know they have a good password, I'm just going to rehash that and save that to the database. That way, the next time they log in, they'll be on the newest hash. It's a very slight performance hit, but it's only that one time when they log in with an old password hash. It's super transparent to you and to the user. Uh, another thing you want to do is safe defaults. So um, safe defaults are declaring your variables with a safe value. A lot of times people will just assume the variable is going to exist. Maybe it's in a loop. Maybe you're in an if block somewhere. Due to sloppy coding or just whatever path the user took, you don't always know that it will exist. You can think it will. Someone can come along later and change something, and then it doesn't. So then maybe you're expecting a string in there, or an array, or whatever, but now you have a null. And so that could trigger something you don't expect in your code. In this case, we're just doing var1 equals default value. So I recommend at the start, either at the start of your methods or the start of your classes, you define all the variables you're going to be using and the default type that should be. So if it's a string and it should always be a string, just define an empty string. If it's an object, maybe define a null. You can always define nulls and then just check for that with an is set. You should just have some type of process in place where you have default values declared. Um, we don't usually like doing that a lot in PHP because PHP is dynamic. We don't have to declare. We don't have to garbage collect, whatever. But it's definitely good coding practice, and it will save you later. Here's an example of uh, something equals false, and then we're doing an array, and we're checking that it equals what we expect. Again, this is just. Um, just saying, if something happened with var foo, maybe var foo was null, or we're checking this somewhere else outside that for each, we want to make sure that we already knew that false was their default. All right, a couple of the common hacks. Non persistent XSS is where you're able to change a user's URL. And this is, again, kind of simplified, but you can change the user's URL and then send them there, and something happens. 
So in this case, we would change, say, this page num equals 2. We could change that to user equals admin or group equals admin. And if the site wasn't coded properly, it would take whatever variables those are and it would save them or execute them just automatically. And because the user came through with their session, because the user's already logged in, you convinced them to click that link somehow. You know, maybe it says free pills or whatever the spam says. You click that link, it takes them to a site that they're already logged into, they already have a good session on, and then it's going to activate whatever is in that code. So you need to check in your code that anything you collect, say from the get variables, does what you expect. It's the variables you expect. You're not just looping through those and executing on them uh, without verifying what they are. Persistent XSS is the same idea, except it's saved to the database and then used later. So an example of that would be Twitter. You're going to say the post on Twitter. You throw in some JavaScript or some HTML or whatever you want to put in there. And then you're going to get that user to go to that post later. So it's not a bad link. You're not passing anything in through the git vars or anything like that. But it's the fact that it's going to display that back to the user. If you don't have proper escaping, like the HTML entities that we showed before on your views, the user could save some JavaScript in there. And then when another user goes to view that Twitter post later, it's going to show up and it's going to execute in their browser. And who knows what could happen? You could, you could open pages. You could submit forms. You could do anything like that with their session. Cross-site request forgery, CSRF, is where across sites you're going to forge a user's information. So in this case, we're showing users 12 delete. Usually this would be a form post or something like that. You're going to get the user to execute this in their current session. So maybe we're going to post the form from the browser that the user's already signed in on. And they have an active session. We're not checking <coughs> that they actually did that. And then it's going to execute. So the user could delete themselves in this case. The way to protect against that is, first off, put your forms behind uh, post, put, update, or delete. You don't want your forms behind get most of the time. That's not the only thing you want to do. That doesn't in itself give you any protection. It just gives you another step so that you can add this next step that protects you. The next step is to add a CSRF token to your forms that you just added. So if there's a GET request, you can't put a form there. or You could, but you can hit it without the form, right? If it's a form, and that's what I mean by post, it can be a GET form, it doesn't matter. But if it's a form, you can have the CSRF token as a hidden field in that form. And what that token does is a one-time use nonce, and it will check to see that this user initiated this request. So it's a one-time use hash on each side. So here's our request to delete the user. We have that hash in there. And then when we go to delete the user, we check to see if that's a valid hash for this user. So we actually know that it was initiated by that user, not someone else. Um, here it's just an example. We're going to create a token, which is just uh, using w random, create a random string. We're going to save that to the session. In this case, session flash. Flash data is something most frameworks add in, which just means a one-time use session variable. So once you use it once, it deletes itself. And then we're just going to return back that token that we use. So we save it in the session, then we're returning it back for use. Here, when we go to process that form, that we'll save as a hidden field, that token was. We're going to check and see, did that posted token that was in that hidden field match what's in our session? So that tells us if the user actually requested this. This gets more complicated. If you have Ajax and stuff, you'll want an array of hashes because you can have multiple requests at once. But the general idea of it is that you're going to post a token and check the token. All right, PHP now has uh, some pretty legit tools for a while now. It's been you know Ruby and Python were the cool kids, and they had all the cool tools, and we just kind of hacked together little view pages or whatever they they thought we were doing. Um, while we were doing legacy software, right? Um, enterprise systems. But now we had some pretty cool tools. So let's take a look. We now have a built in web server. So to get started with the PHP project, you no longer have to go through and set up Apache or Nginx, set up your whole LAMP stack and get all that working, have a web server locally set up. Maybe it conflicts with anything else you're doing. Now PHP has this just built in. You can run PHP minus capital S 
And then the URL and port that you want to access that on, it's going to take your current directory that you're in with these options, and it's going to start up a local web server on that. It's not something you want to use in production. It's not very robust. But for local development, it's great. I use it a lot when I'm freelancing. So let's say maybe I have you know, five freelance projects. I can just CD into the directory that I'm currently working on for this project, start up a web server, and I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about what other Apache settings I have, and if they might conflict, or if I'm using Nginx on this project, things like that. That's a real quick, easy way to get going with new projects, especially if you switch projects a lot. Composer. Who here uses Composer? All right, it's actually less than I expected. So, <coughs> Composer is sane package management for PHP. It has a <coughs> auto loading built in, and uh, it uses PSR four for that, which we'll get into. It's uh, I'm going to say similar to Pear, even though it's not. So, who here has used Pear or knows what Pear is? All right, okay, probably a lot more people. Pear was kind of the traditional. Package managed for PHP. It was horrible. It was a really clunky interface. Packages were never updated. There's no real way to tell what the best packages were. And over time, it just decayed. When it was new and fresh, it was pretty good. But over time, it decayed. Composer's basically the replacement for that. It is a protocol or a system set up. And it also uses packages to distribute the packages there. This is the most popular one. You can run your own Composer server. You can promote your own packages yourself, but packages is the most popular PHP package listing. In order to use this, we're just going to add a composer.json file to our project. This is just standard JSON object. We're going to add in the name of the projects we want and then the versions. So this handles dependencies, versioning, all that for you. In this case, we're just going to say dev master. So that means whatever the current latest develop is on this branch, we're going to use that. You can also set a specific version here. You can set different require settings for dev and production. So maybe you need unit testing tools on your dev, but not on production, which is how you should do it. Then you can have different require settings for that, and it will handle pulling all that in for you. you do php composer.far update, and that will update the current settings based on your JSON file. That will also create a lock file for you. And then if you do install, it's going to use that lock file to download those exact packages. So let's say on your local, you're prepping the certain release. You're using these four packages. You want these exact versions when you go to production. You save that lock file. You just commit it to your Git or whatever. And then on your production server, you're going to do composer install. And it's going to use that lock file to pull down those exact versions. Also, if you're on a multi-dev team, you do an install, and then you know you're all on the same version of each piece of software instead of having that dependency hell where you never know what version anyone's on. What this looks like, because it uses PSR4 autoloading, is we can just say new services Twilio, because we included that Twilio class earlier, and it's going to set up the autoload the class automatically for us, and it's available. We don't have to worry about what paths is under. We don't have to worry about the version. We don't have to go to GitHub and get it, whatever like that. We just did Composer update, then it's available, and we can run it. PHP is continually growing its unit testing tools. Also, the unit testing support between various packages and libraries and software is growing. Um, for a long time, unit testing was kind of looked down upon in PHP. We cared more about getting things done than we cared about doing things the right way. And that's slowly changing. There's been a pretty big evolution in PHP over the past few years to really care about good software quality. Part of that is unit testing. What unit testing is, is you write scripts. Basically, you write a script to test your script. So you're writing code that will test your code to make sure it works how you expect it to work. So let's say, early example, we have a method that returns a name for a user. We could write a unit test that would go and check and make sure that name was returned pop properly, it's a string, et cetera, so that we know anytime that runs, it's doing the right thing and no one broke it. Um, some popular tools for this are listed there. The most popular is probably PHP unit. That's strict unit testing. Selenium is also very popular, but it's not unit testing, it's uh, acceptance testing. 
You can use it in conjunction with unit testing, depending on your use case. But the idea behind those two, unit testing says, this class, this unit of my code, works how I expect. I get the proper output every time, proper input, proper output, they match, right? Acceptance testing means from the whole of the site, so let's say from their web browser, I can click through these four pages and everything interacts properly throughout those four pages. So depending on the scope of your project, how important it is, you probably want to do both. You at least want to do unit testing so you can make sure everything you write, every component you use works properly at all times. And then you can expand on that and say, okay, all these pieces fit together, now work properly. What this looks like is class API auth test, and it extends to the PHP unit test case. Here, we're just going to implement a new API authentication, and then we're going to make sure that it verifies to true. And cert true is the real thing we want to showcase here. What that means is make sure that what's returned from what we're passing in, in this case, auth verify, make sure auth verify returns true. If it does, our test case passes. If it doesn't, our test case will fail. Super simple example, but you can see here, if it's false, we know that we failed. We then just run that with PHP unit test, and it'll run through all the tests. Here we have one test, one assertion, and they're both passed, and it gives us the time of that. All right, we're wrapping up. We have uh, just a few resources for you to look into. <coughs> PHP.net has actually gotten uh, very good over recent years. It was kind of the kludgy um, a few years ago, but now it's very up to date. It covers most everything you're going to need. Very extensive. Definitely recommend, uh, I keep that open in a separate tab all the time while I'm coding. How, how does this work? What method do these go in? What order? Things like that. Also recommend you check out some modern frameworks. Um, here are just a few of the modern frameworks. You'll see very um, interesting concepts. You'll see more patterns, more extractions, things like that through these frameworks. And you'll definitely learn a lot. So not even just using them. I'm not a huge component of using every framework or using frameworks for every task. But I recommend you read through some of the code. Especially there's a framework that you read the docs and you're like, oh, this way of doing things really clicks with me. Go through and read the code. See how they did it and learn something from it. Because obviously, they're good at what they do, right? And there's definitely things to learn there. PHP the Right Way is a website and a book. The book has a small fee, but I think 100% of donations go to the EFF. The website has the same content. It's a lot of the newest ways, the most modern and accepted ways of doing things in PHP. So if you haven't messed with PHP in a couple of years, or maybe there's something you're fuzzy on the right way to do it now, because things have changed so much, check that out. It might have some good advice for you on the most accepted way to do it now. Uh, my ebook that I mentioned earlier, Build Secure PHP Apps, goes into a bit more depth on the concepts we covered as far as security. You can get three bucks off if you use the Open West coupon code. And joined in, if you could please go rate the talk on joined in, it's 13901 is the code for this talk. I would really appreciate it. It helps me know what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong, and it helps organizers know if they should invite me in the future. All right, we have uh, five minutes. Questions? Sure. I don't really do much server stuff. Um, usually that would be on the server level, or it would be an application implementation. So you would just log in your application and then maybe use Nagios or some tool to check your logs and monitor on those. Another question? Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining me today. If you want to talk anymore, I'll be up here and I'll be outside chilling. So thanks.